Welcome to the number one Bengals podcast. I'm your host, Daddy McDook. On the guitar, there is my co host, Dr. Hoji Electric Smoji, who is not here yet, but I am joined by John the Brain Sheeran and Bridget the, H- Bridget the HR Jan Cars. How are you guys doing today? I'm good. Just waiting for Hoji's flight back from France. Yeah, he was purchasing a watch is what I heard. And here's the thing. We're going to get to a lot of fashion news very soon. And we have our fashion experts, Bridget and Hoji. But first, John, I want to talk to you, our football expert, about some football-related things to the Cincinnati Bengals, starting with T. Higgins, signs the franchise tag. Solomon Wilcox comes out and says this is a statement that he wants to win, that this team is all in. When Trey Hendrickson, when he requested, you know, a, a, a new contract and then threatened with retirement, he came back because everybody's like, this is our chance. So, John, this is a good sign in a way, but this is the bad sign that this is their last chance. I don't think it's a bad sign. I think it's it's kind of in the middle. Like, I don't think anyone expected either T. Higgins or Trey Hendrickson to actually be traded. This kind of falls in line with whenever people try to stick it players try to stick it to Mike Brown and the Blackburn family the players typically end up losing but they don't really lose right because they still get paid the money that they agreed uh, to get paid and in T Higgins's case he still gets more money than he's ever made in his entire career obviously the the negative of the franchise tag is he has no long-term security which then leads into what you were talking about this is the last year that T Higgins knows that he's going to be in Cincinnati the last year he knows he's going to play with Jamar Chase and Joe Burrow a, a triumvirate if you will that has been very successful when all three have been on the field at the same time since 2021. So yeah, there is that sort of kind of feeling of a last dance, even though the Bengals have prepared themselves, I think in a lot of ways to continue extending this window open for as long as Burrow is here. I think parts of the roster, particularly in the wide receiver room with both Yoshi and Jermaine Burden, it, it, it leads you to believe that there is definitely life beyond however long Teagans is going to be here. But in regards to like both those guys, you know, making their decisions to, to either sign the, the tender in Teagans' case or re- rescind the trade request and show for practice in Hendrickson's case, neither one of those guys are going to get what they supposedly wanted, which would, would be off the team because, again, like the Bengals were never in a position to do that. They never really were forced to do so. The, the Bengals always held the leverage in that case. And this is just them just speeding up the process and saying, yeah, like this is what's best for me. And they're just going to go ahead and do that. John, I have a question for you. Hypothetical. What would it take for T. Higgins to be back next year? Now, I don't think under any scenario, the Bengals are going to pay him $25 million a year, even next year. I just don't see it. It just doesn't seem to be. just for one year? Hits. Oh, maybe for one year. I just don't think they're going to give him you know, $100 million guaranteed or something. Not because they don't like him as a player. It's just because they have Jamar Chase, because how the team is structured and all that. So in your mind, what would it take for him to be back? No, I think if he plays well and the Bengals determine that he's more valuable for a $26 million price tag for just one year, which is what the franchise tag would be next year if they were to place the franchise tag on him again, if they determine that he's that good after whatever year that he has, then that's the scenario when he'll be back. Of course, I don't think the Bengals have ever double tagged a player before. But because of how the wide receiver market has progressed in terms of just getting near and above that $30 million per year price tag, and for the players like T. Higgins, like the, the Jalen Waddles of the world, like that's still near $30 million a year, right? So it's still an area where, uh, for a long-term extension, I don't think the Bengals are, are interested. But it's grown so much to the point where that, that $26 million price tag for just one season looks very enticing when you're talking about T. Higgins coming off of you know, hypothetically, a healthy and dominant season when he's playing in this offense where everyone knows that he's a true asset that fits really well. So that's the scenario in which he'll be back. But I agree with you. I, I think no matter what, they're not going to give him the, the deal that he and Mulligata wants in terms of a long-term deal. I mean, he could not sign the tag next year, right? Mm-hmm. But then he would have to sit out or? Yeah. So like if okay. he doesn't sign the tag, then he doesn't, he doesn't play. So if he has and... a great year, I think there's a chance he could do that if they tag him. Right, if he knows because he's coming off a bad year this year, that's my opinion. Is why right. he had to sign the tag. Well, the whole reason be- behind like the tagging him again is that you at least hold on to his rights, and therefore, if a trade were to happen, right, then you have a player in T Higgins who is more valuable to another team, 
And not only is that the case, then the Bengals may see the price or the compensation that they would desire if they were to trade one of their best players, which again, just like the double tag is very unlikely because the Bengals don't trade their best players unless they feel like they absolutely have to. But if Higgins in this case says, I'm not going to play on the tag for another year, and he does pull the exact same thing that Le'Veon Bell did, then at least the Bengals would say, okay, well, at least your value is better. And at least teams are more willing to part with the compensation that we, the Bengals, would want in that case. So that, that's how that whole thing would, would unfold if, if, if Higgins decided to go that route. But, but again, going the Le'Veon Bell route is not something that any player should, should want to do. Yeah, that was a disaster. Okay, moving on. I want to talk about the Jerry Jones comments about the Cincinnati Bengals. <laughs> so he comes out, and John, the, 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 the NFL they have a form of revenue sharing. And this is something that Jerry Jones is defending, that we need to keep this. But he was trying to rub it in our faces that if we didn't do that, and each team could sell their rights on their own, he would be the biggest beneficiary because he makes a lot more money than the Bengals. And I, I, I yeah. don't know if, I mean, I think that's part of it. Like obviously the Cowboys are a brand that the Bengals even over the past couple of years can't necessarily compete with. I think it was more or less the lines of if the Bengals had their own package of like watching their out of market games and the Cowboys had their own package, then more people would would purchase the Cowboys package compared to the Bengals. And of course, he didn't have to single out the Bengals exclusively. This this would be the case for a plethora of NFL teams, regardless of the quality of those teams. Mind you, the Cowboys haven't been past the divisional round of the playoffs in 30 years, longer than I've been alive. So he was making a point in the sense that, yeah, the Cowboys are still that brand and the Cowboys would benefit a lot if everything went, went private. But apparently Jones and Mike Brown have been beefing for a while, I think, yeah. uh, in regards to like the revenue sharing. And this was just a 90-year-old man trying to just play the authority card, I guess, for whatever reason. But, yeah, it yeah. was stupid. But, I mean, Bridget, you are on the ground. You are going to Bengals games across the country. You are seeing all these Bengals fans. You are paying for a lot of Bengals games and to watch the Bengals. You're the only one on the show who pays <laughs> to watch the Bengals. So you know better than anybody that it's not the 1997 Bengals. It's not the mid nineties, you know, late nineties. It's not those Bengals, or I should say even early nineties when it was a disaster. This is very, it's not even the Carson Palmer Bengals. No, but the Cowboys are. The, well, the Cowboys are the, well, that's true. The Cowboys they, are the Carson Palmer Bengals. But in terms of results, but in terms yes. of value and the, the money that people pay to watch the Cowboys, they are still, I think, John, I think they're still America's team. I think they're still the most valuable franchise, right? Probably, yeah. yeah. I, I haven't looked at the numbers, but yeah, I would say that's still the case. At considering this point, the amount of games that are on TV for them. At this point, the appeal of the Cowboys is like the appeal of baseball. It's just the nostalgia. It's just the, the imagery. It's not about their actual results. But what I want to say is, what is your message, Bridget, to Jerry Jones about the fact that Bengals fans are coming, that we are spending a lot. How much money have you spent on the Bengals just um, in the last year, Bridget? We don't need to talk. Probably, about yeah, that. exactly. <laughs> Probably more than it would take to feed me and John for an entire year. More than Jerry Jones has spent to improve his own team, but yeah. <laughs> Is that like at just like twenty five hundred dollars? If that. Um, no, well, well, what I've really liked, I saw maybe a couple of posts on Twitter that were uh, Jerry Jones from, was it the 50s or the 60s? I don't like what he stood for, but right, Jerry Jones is a known racist. And what I, what I think is really interesting about this, just in terms of like the Jerry Jones and we'll call it the Brown Black, Blackburn family, maybe like beef or, or owner's beef, is that Mike Brown, and I, I think I've talked about this on other episodes of the show, Mike or um, Paul Brown, rather. Paul Brown was really a vanguard in racial equity. Like in the 60s, he, or in the like late 60s, early 70s, he wouldn't have his team, this must have been actually when he was with the Browns, just thinking about when the Bengals started, but he wouldn't have his teams, like if they went to a hotel in the South, he wouldn't, and the, the hotel was like, hey, we won't allow your black players to stay here, or if they're, they're not allowed to room with their white teammates, Paul Brown would call the league and be like, we're not going to play here. And we're certainly not going to stay at this hotel. And so I think there's something really interesting just about like Jerry Jones, probably known racism and um, 
just bad character coupled with what the Browns have stood for. And they are not perfect. They are not perfect. But I think that's a really interesting juxtaposition when you think about kind of the history and even the legacy of both of those old men. Yeah. So basically it's the North versus the South is what you're telling me is, is Mike Brown versus Jerry Jones. I mean, Jerry Jones, he's an oil tycoon. I mean, he made, yeah. he made his money off of exploits and the Brown family doesn't make money out of, out of anything except, except for football. So there was always yeah. a difference in the contrast and how they believe they should do business. And I think that's, it's just been 30 something years ever since, yeah. you know, Jones and Brown have been in at technically the same position, but they just operate business in completely different ways. Well, I, I, I remember the, the, the biography of Jerry Jones with Daniel Day Lewis, and it is, he was very, very ruthless man. A, a boy was abandoned. Yeah. Okay, John, let us move on to other Bengals news because a lot of people are saying there's no Bengals news right now. There's nothing to talk about. However, for instance, go, John. <laughs> There's Action. news. Uh, this is news to me. The, the news is I'm being bombarded with new news that I wasn't aware was news in the first place. I right. think all the players are away from the team. There actually hasn't been a practice well, in about a I, week and a half, you know? Yes, but John, I did go to Bengals.com mm -hmm. and I saw the news. It was about diehard Bengals fan Kevin Euclidus in yeah. the age of Joe Burrow. That is the extent of the news we have right now. We are talking about fans now. now. That is, so let me ask you, John, give me a report of a Bengals fan that is special in your life. A Bengals fan that's special in my life? Yeah, I'm just trying to kill time till Hoji gets here, so. Oh, okay, I got you. Um, I'd probably say the, the person who, I think, kind of introduced me to the Bengals in the first place, his name is Todd Pendry, and he's been the season ticket holder for long before I was even alive. And he's got arguably the best Bengals man cave that I've ever seen. And he and his family were the people who kind of instilled the Bengals on me at an early age, especially with a family history of, of rooting for the Steelers. So that was kind of a, a clash uh, with, with my personal, you know, type of fandom when I was six, seven years old. But if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be on the show with a Bengals picture in the background. In fact, the picture that you see kind of in this corner that is with Todd's kids. They're my lifelong best friends. And they took me down to training camp in Georgetown when it was still down there. And they, I mean, they're the biggest Bengals fans that I know on a personal level. Sometimes we need to recognize there are a lot of diehard fans that have been with the team for decades now that aren't in the spotlight, but just care, care about the team and know as much about the team as anyone. So shout out to Todd Pendry. Shout well, out to I Todd. Well, I feel a, yeah. that was beautiful. That was First beautiful. of all, we, we got to get Todd on the show. We got to right? clap. Yeah. But John, I feel attacked. My back is in the safety video. <laughs> if you look at the north exit, there's someone in a white Jamar Chase jersey who lifts up the ruler of the jungle staff, and that is me. So I feel attacked. And John, I just want to say there's a lot of Bengals fans who are not seen because they don't go to the games because maybe they are investing their money elsewhere, but they love the mm -hmm. games. They've been following the games. They have been reading the you know notifications on their phone for the recaps of games for a very long time they, you could say they, they don't even watch the games they don't well, watch the games they sometimes catch the the short clips of the mm -hmm. games because they're so busy worrying about the team they can't they can't spend all that time watching isn't it them. crazy that those like, same fans like want to talk about the team to like an audience it's well, here's the thing. Those they fans, write about them? but they love. But that's the thing. They write about them, but they have good friends in high places who really understand the team, and they connect mm -hmm. through them with the team. So, there's there's all sorts of Bengals fans that I feel like John, you could honor in this segment here, and I think Bengals.com should honor Todd, and I think that he should get that you know that big check from Hude where he goes to the Super Bowl. And then they take him to, where is it, John? They take him to like the Capitol, he meets the president. He should do all of that. Yeah. So, yeah, but bring Todd on the show, John. I'll see what I can do. All right. Well, we have waited for Dr. Hoji for quite some time. I think we can start the fashion segment, Bridget. Let's do it. So, I'm wearing my most fashionable Henley t-shirt today. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling very, I'm, I'm channeling my inner Joan Rivers right now. So, so give me some context here. Let us talk about, first of all, let's talk about Jamar Chase. We'll go in order. Jamar Chase was seen in Paris 
with a $5 million watch. And a lot of people are saying, okay, that's great, but it's very dangerous. And also you could feed a few countries with that watch. Bridget, also inaccurate, 500,000. 500,000 countries. Bridget, <laughs> with, your, with your knowledge of fashion, but you're also your desire to help the downtrodden, what is your stance on this watch? Go. I mean, people drive $500,000 cars. I mean, these guys are making millions and millions of dollars a year. Would it be wonderful if we lived in a more socialist society and distributed that wealth? Probably. I, I think most people watching wouldn't agree with that. So do I personally think it's a little bananas to wear a 500K watch out in public? Sure. Um, but people wear expensive jewelry all the time. I, I mean, he is no different than any other player with any other expensive thing. So I say you do you, Uno. Okay. So what I'm sensing here, Bridget, is that you have a watch of similar value. That's just what I I'm sensing. do not. This Garmin watch costs like $200, maybe. Wow. $200. So no. John, when was the last time you saw $200? For me, it was a long time, long time ago. Two hundred dollars. What's money? Wait. Uh, there we it go. It goes up that much. Well, let us not get into that, John, because the 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 investment in your future through this internship is, is mm. worth way more than money. But John, I want to get your take. What do you think in terms of Jamar Chase? Does how does this impact his future in the NFL? Are defenders going to be like, oh, because you remember, let's take OBJ, let's take Odell Beckham, right? He kind of put a target on his back, a little bit. What did you say? Uh, when was this? When he was posting up on a boat with like some Tims on? Yeah. I think that was around the time. Right. I feel like he maybe, maybe put target, maybe it was with, with GMs, maybe with, but I feel like his, his career kind of changed when he became so. Do you think this is going to impact Jamar Chase in any way? Probably not. I think if you wear a watch while in, during the games, like people don't understand the value of a watch. I think people just think of it as a, a way to just check out what time it is. It's a way to blind you, man. Like when, when you when you got v, when you got VVs that are shining like you and twenty four carats like that, it's tough for a cornerback. You need you need a visor at that point to be able to mirror up with them. I feel like if he brings it on the onto the field, it's gonna be tough to guard up on man to man. It's already it's already tough enough to match up with him on man to man. But if you if he whips that out, man, he's gonna be shining bright. Wow, that was a great take. That was, that was a great a really take. Good Both take. of you that, are putting me in my place. When I'm trying to when I'm trying to get something going here, both of you are, are putting okay, fine, fine. So the watch is fine, but John, maybe uh, avert your eyes here, John. So here's the thing. I have a split many a pants. And so it, I understand. And, and shirts. I understand that it could be a way of essentially identifying with his audience and saying that, like you, I sometimes don't fit in my clothing. I, I could understand that perspective, but it is where it is a split, John, in the back. It just doesn't make sense to me. I think that was Bane, honestly. Um, Joe Burrow's back is much bigger, I think, than I expected. And maybe yeah. that's a testament to his offseason regimen. It could just be a case of like, hey, try this jacket on. It doesn't fit. And then they just kind of yeah. ran into a new look. That's what I'm like that, like that, that's what fashion is, is it not? Like I run into these trends months after they originate. I'm like, where did this start? It all starts someplace, right? And I feel like the origins of these new fashion trends are a lot more humble in in their or in, the, in their origins than maybe we give them credit for. We think it's like some some interesting deeper meaning with like with the way that that this that these clothes are. Maybe it's just the case of it just not fitting and that's yeah. what makes it unique. I hope but so. I, I, I will say, yeah. I will say though if he wears better. that in Cincinnati, he's going to get a lot of sunburn on his back, which I wouldn't yeah. recommend. I don't yeah. think it sun works like that in France. Couple no, Skyline Bridget. Killers. Bridget, what's your analysis? No, no, no. There is a much deeper meaning. I, I, for all of our viewers, I have watched that video 
40 times. And th this is just all in the name of really high quality journalism and not the fact that Joe Burrow also now seems to look like a Ken doll, uh, which I'm not mad at. I feel like there's symbolism. And what has Joe Burrow been plagued by in the past, in the rearview mirror, in the back? It's injuries. It's a lost Super Bowl in the last minute and 55-ish seconds. It's Joe Burrow, or it's uh, Jamar Chase beating Ramsey and what could have been. What I think he is telling us is don't look in the back. While there's something to see here, there's also nothing to see here. Look in the front. It's all in front of us. And that is he and Anna Wintour designed it. They're sending us a signal. That's all like not all it is. It's everything it is. And there is deeper meaning. Don't look, don't look in the back. There's nothing there. We are all we yeah. are all forward for well, Joe Burrow. There really was nothing there. And I would say if I was wearing that jacket, you wouldn't be able to tell that it was ripped because, you know, because I have some hair, if you will. Joe Burrow, Joe Burrow, where is the body hair? Is that not concerning? I think I think wax was probably used yeah. uh, right before that. But I think I, I think I agree with Bridget here because I know for a fact that no one really cared about what the back looked like. I looked at the quote tweets of that video and I think more, more people were focused on the front and I've been kind of BSing my way through the segment but I will say with a lot of definitive confidence here that that video and the replies to that video are going to be used by me every time quarterback rankings and quarterback debates are shown because if you are trying to tell me if a man is trying to tell me that a Dak Prescott or a Lamar Jackson is better than Joe Burrow I'm going to show that man the quote tweets of that video, and he's going to realize that his girl has Joe Burrow as his, as her background on her phone, and then the argument's over. If your quarterback is, is that, and he and he makes girls flustered like that, it, there there is no debate in my opinion. Like, and since he's never been in this situation before, and I think we just kind of have to take this and run with it. Like, Joe Burrow's just that dude. Okay, that's fair. But John, I don't. I'm sorry, Bridget. I don't know how to phrase this. But well, look at this. We have Dr. Hoji here. Yeah, there we are. Yeah, hello. Yeah, what I yeah. miss? Well, you missed more like lot. fashionably late. Yeah, well, uh, well how late? How, how late? It was 23 minutes, huh? Okay, 20. Well, we waited 10 minutes, so okay. <laughs> that's a good half hour. Yeah, okay, so here's where we are. So I just woke up, just woke up off the flight from France, right? Well, we right we know you were coming right from right from Paris, right. Canes or Nice, nice. You could say niece. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So we have in review, we have gone over the Jamar Chase watch, which Bridget says it is okay if he is using up the resources of the deprived children across the world because yeah. he's a football player. And, 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 you, and you discussed then, the symbolic dimension. Tick tock. Tick tock. Tick tock. You it spend is, a lot of money on a watch, you're telling people. I'm on a timer. I won't be here forever. This is, this is a message to Cincinnati Bengals, obviously, right? You guys already know. Mm, we, yeah. we missed well, that, but well, there it is. It was too shiny for me to see that. Yeah. So he's, and, he's spending a lot on watches. He's saying, you're not going to have me forever unless you pay me five, a lot of money. Like this I watch. see. Yeah. I see. Okay. And then we, we looked at the Joe Burrow video. Okay, a bit cringy. And, yeah. Ooh, really? What, what? Say more. Wait a minute. Am I the only person who thinks this? John and I think it's like neurotic. Did you say neurotic? We did. No. No. Oh, no. symbolic. Symbolic. Oh, okay. Tell me. Tell me. How did you guys read that? The the the. He's saying that. I, you look forward, not back. That's oh, I, the summary. That, yeah. He's exposed, but he's wearing a jacket. Yeah. So the inner child is bare and naked, but also sheathed and covered. Maybe, or maybe it's that he's been in the rehab so long. It's like a watermelon where the part that's on the ground is kind of turns, it turns yellowish. It's bright colored. You really know your watermelons. Cause that's like only, only some of that read a lot of well, watermelon for about $7 lore. right now at, at Walmart, you can get $7. enough watermelon 
Well, the, for the whole watermelon. You can feed uh, yourself for about a week. At least he's buying them now. He used to just pick up old watermelon. Well, you know, the white part, it's it's very nutritious. And a lot of people just throw it out. Right. You can actually make it. Yeah, you can make uh, good shakes out of the white part. Okay, John. I am not for Joe Burrow modeling in France. No. I think it's a big mistake. No, and I, I was this saying is this. not at all here's, how here's I expected my this to go. And same. But I want to hear more. Well, I mean, <clears throat> look, uh, football... Uh, you got it. It it fifty percent of it is talent and, and and effort and all of that. The other fifty percent is how do people perceive you, and being a model, I I don't think fits what you want to be on the field. Where's the tough guy image? Where's the where's the fear? You know. Oh, I might I might disagree with this because I feel like I feel like the the quarterbacks who are or maybe the football players in general who are more consumed with the idea of wanting to be masculine and wanting to be like rigged and tough i feel like they wouldn't expose themselves in ways where yeah like maybe some people are going to look at the, the at the things that i wear and maybe they'll make fun of me right and maybe they don't want to do that because they're secretly insecure which all bullies are right all all fake tough guys are are insecure and, and they're not and they're too afraid to do anything outside of, of what they think is going to be normal for them to do i feel like taking that risk and putting yourself out there and trying new things which is really the whole you know purpose of what burrow is doing in, in paris right now he's, he's learning new things he's embracing something that he yeah. likes to do and part of that is maybe taking a little bit of a risk okay okay so counter and it's all I feel like this is like the Harrison Butker versus like the Joe Burrow. Right? You've got the Harrison Butker who has offended a lot of us by like wanting to keep women in the kitchen or traditional gender roles. And then you've got Joe Burrow who is not afraid to show like a more feminine side. He was wearing a purse at one point on his trips to Paris. And if I had to pick, if I had to pick on a continuum between Harrison Butker, like what Harrison Butker represents and what Joe Burrow represents, I'm going Burrow all day. Okay. okay. Wait, I, that's in I, terms I, of... Hold on. Well, may well, I, may I, because yeah. I, I, I brought yeah. this up. May I just respond? Yes. So as you guys know, I used to be a quarterback coach. Right. And I would, one of the things that I did was help uh, QBs improve their image. And uh, I had some basic advice. Number one, take up smoking. Number two, do you have a truck? No, get one. Is it a pickup truck? How big are the tires? Number three, tank top? Yes, all the time, right? Right. Basic advice to, to get the image pumped up and get the opponent really to, to see your masculinity. Yeah. Do you have well, a beard? Do you have yeah. a mustache? Well, not only that, I was telling Bridget, if it was me or Hoji wearing that jacket, you wouldn't be able to tell because the, the back would be black as well. Yes. It would be with a lot of, lot of hair. Now, to Hoji's point, I, and well, let me address Bridget's point. Excellent point. Obviously, you would rather hang out with the Joe Burrow. I understand that as a human being, but we're talking about football here. Yeah, we're sure. talking about a very angry, yes. violent yes. sport where people are throwing out insults at each other, at their families. And these are, these are part of the rules. These are written in the playbooks. And so I want to just kind of take a tour through QB fashion. And so when we see Joe Burrow here, we have, you know, okay, no, no shirt, no nothing, very clean shaven, right? Obviously nothing in the back. And you compare him to some of, look at, look, this is GQ. This is very fashionable. But look at what he's and wearing. By the way, that's, Just that's very, when Joe Montana was 26 years old. Right. And then here you have Dan Marino, right? Very, very fashionable, but at the same time, <laughs> very much a QB. And he's, look at the guys next to him. You have Jeff Blake, former oh Bengals. Quite, very that. fashionable. He was a GQ type person, but just wearing your, your traditional. And then you have a Joe Burrow. Look at that. You very have a Joe different. Burrow. Very different. And then you have, look at this, Patrick Mahomes. What is that? Is that the well, jumpsuit? Why uh, is it that one, color? That was also on my list of QBs. He's clearly read my list. I Jump, feel like so. all of those outfits fit those quarterbacks and their personalities pretty well. That's and I don't think anything's, no, there's no problem at all. I think it's all positive. I feel like. I love how you embrace everything, yeah. John. True John, cancer. John, I just feel like the no hair, right? I feel like, you know, it's opposing defenders are not going to mind being, you know, being so close with, with what, Joe what do you, who, who do you, wait, hold on a second. Who do you think is tougher to tackle? Someone that you can grab on the body hair or someone who just kind of slips yeah, through your fingers? You can't, you don't grab it. on body hair, John. I don't know. I mean, if you have enough, apparently, according to you, you have plenty. It's friction, yeah, but, that, but it, it stops growing after a certain point. It gets to a certain length and then it stops. I've seen Seinfeld. It grows more 
Hold on. But Hoji, I feel like you don't have to answer this. You can just sure. be, give me like maybe like a head signal. I feel like okay. the two quarterbacks who took your advice the most were in this order: Uncle Rico and Gardner Minshew. Can you confirm or deny that? Confirm. Okay, cool. Yeah, and they won't confirm it, but you'd be surprised how many people out there have consulted with me on their style. Yeah, two successful guys. Burt Bert Reynolds was our. If Burt Reynolds was a QB. He might not have been great, but he would have looked great. Well, he was in the longest yard, was he not? He was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's a different body hair composition entirely. That's true. Well, I think we've exhausted that discussion. Well, you can't you... end the show now. I just got here. <laughs> we can just talk planet. about... Did, so uh, you should have put up, daddy the picture of Joe Burrow playing chess in the pink shorts and the cutoff because that looked i mean that could have been dan marino and bridget can we confirm whether whether joe burrow has a girlfriend at the moment or not because i know he broke up with his previous i know i can't confirm anything aren't you no he hasn't lived no he hasn't lived over here in a i don't know he didn't live here last season and by here i mean the neighborhood not in my particular home okay so he's available bridget Control I have yourself. no idea. Well, and is Jamar married girlfriend? What's the what's the what's the download? Does anybody know? Is Jamar what? Married, single. Oh, married. I it's don't know. We is. know Cody Ford is no longer engaged. That made its way around TikTok. Okay. That's well, how did we miss that? That seems really important. Okay. What's that? Well. And you guys already discussed the whole Drake, Kendrick Lamar thing. That already you guys missed out that too. No, there's nothing to discuss. That that was a one-sided affair. Being you side with Drake, I'm guessing, like me. Excuse me. No one sides with Drake. Don't we all side with Drake? No. Drake. No one is siding with Drake. He's Canadian. He has to be. He's kind. Canadians are kind. You would be surprised. Is, Is Drake not kind? Boy, I've missed so much. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. You can subscribe to the show. You can turn on notifications. You can follow John's articles on a to z at sports.com slash Cincinnati. You can support John. You can support body hair. All of these things if you go to patreon.com slash dh sports. And don't forget to follow all of us on Twitter. And that's about all we got. We will see you next time on the number one Bengals podcast. So long, sweetie. Bye. They not like us. They not like us.